going to begin on time because I want you to have all your time in your class and we'll just talk people in as they come. I hope we'll begin by doing it out in the narthex. Thank you, Barbara, very much. There's so much happening this morning and uh, we will talk um, at, before the lecture, we will talk about, we won't talk about the election, but we will address of what our country needs now from us, and I think that has been addressed by the various people who won and lost, and so it is something that I think that we, we need to do, and I thought this morning, I've had this, <clears throat> this um, one little thing that I had always wanted to share, and I don't know that we have done this in here. I know that I have not done it in here, but even if I have, sometimes things that are worth doing are worth doing twice. But it's from the Applause of Heaven and uh, written by Max Lucado, who I think is still with his wife and we need to pray for his ministry. He is a great writer and he has a, a real gift of uh, finding biblical scriptural applications from just things that happen. That is a really special gift, you know, to go to bed at night and look at what has happened to you and think, where does this fit into scripture? What can I do with this in light of God's word? Can I take it even, maybe it was a bad thing. Maybe it was a difficult thing. Maybe it was a thing that made you very unhappy or it was hurtful or what, but that you can find a verse to turn that around so you can see that God can use that in your life. And Max Lucado does that, and he's funny. And you know, I, I'm, I like to have fun. They always joke about me a lot, that uh, say that if it's not fun, I, I don't really like to do it. But I just feel that, that, that I'm sure that Jesus had fun, and in heaven there is going to be fun. And, and so we want to laugh a lot. And we do know that laughter is very healing. And so this morning, I think we need to laugh because some of you may be unhappy. Some of you may be happy about your election, but whatever has happened, you still need to laugh. It's a great medicine. <clears throat> and so he, uh, in this book, has um, a, a, a chapter on the state of the heart. And he talks about blessed are the pure in heart. Now, that's one of the blessings from the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the pure in heart. And in order for us to have a pure heart and in order for us to be blessed and be blessed by the being pure in heart is, of course, to have given our heart to the Lord Jesus, to have come to him, to have said, hey, I really do things that are wrong and I'm, and I'm not happy, you know, because I think because we're made in God's image, we are made not to be happy when we do things that are wrong. And even the scripture says, and I don't know where it is, if someone knows it, call it out, for a little while, sin is pleasure. Little while. That's the first bite of the snicker bar before it hits and it becomes weight. But a little bit of sin goes a long way. And, and then in the end, it has really hurt you. It's, and so those of you who have had things happen to you that you thought were, was just a great experience, and later you found out was was really bad, you know. And so, <clears throat> anyway, he talks about the heart a lot, and and he talks about keeping your heart clean, and having God take it and use it for your for His glory and for making your life happy. And so he says, when my family lived in Rio de Janeiro, I owned a ham radio, and I kept it in the utility room on top of the freezer. And when we traveled, I always unplugged the radio and disconnected the antenna. You can hear it coming, can't you? Once, when we were leaving for a week-long trip, I remembered I hadn't unplugged the radio, and I ran into the house hurriedly, and I pulled the plug, and I dashed out again. But <clears throat> I pulled the wrong plug. How many of you have ever done that? Yeah, we've all had that freezer go bad, haven't we? I unplugged the freezer, and it was summertime, and summer in Rio de Janeiro defines, redefines the word hot. Our apartment was on the top of a 14th floor story building, which adds another degree of intensity to the word hot, and for seven days then, a freezer full of food sat in a sweltering apartment with the power off. 
then he says, why are you groaning? Well, we're women, and that's why we're groaning. It's awful. And when we came home, Denalyn decided to get some meat out of the freezer. And as she opened the freezer door, well, I won't go into details as to what she saw, but I will say it was a moving experience. Guess who got fingered as the one who had unplugged the freezer and who therefore would be responsible for cleaning it. Now, I think that's fair, don't you? I do not, has nothing to do with liberation. I just think that we all need to do what we need to do. He says, you got it. So I got the work. And what is the best way to clean out a rotten interior? Well, I knew exactly what to do. I got a rag and a bucket of soapy water, and I began cleaning the outside of the appliance. Hmm? I was sure the odor would disappear with a good shine, so I polished and I buffed and wiped. And when I was through, the freezer could have passed a marine boot camp inspection because it was sparkling. But when I opened the door, that freezer was revolting. Are you wondering, now what kind of fool would do that? Well, read on and you're going to see. No problem, I thought. I knew what to do. This freezer needs some friends. I'd stink too if I had the social life of a machine in a utility room. So I threw a party and I invited all the appliances from the neighborhood kitchens. It was hard work, but we filled our apartment with refrigerators and stoves and microwaves and washing machines, and it was a great party. A couple of toasters recognized each other from the appliance store, and everyone played pin the plug in the socket and had a few laughs about limited warranties. And the blenders were the hit, though. They really mixed well. <laughs> it's very good, isn't it good? I was sure the social interaction would cure the inside of my freezer, but I was wrong. I opened it up, and the stink was even worse. Now what? Well, I had another idea. If a polished job wouldn't do it, and a social life didn't help, I'd give the freezer some status. I bought a Mercedes sticker. I stuck it on the door. I bought a paisley tie down, I put, painted a paisley tie down the front. I put a Save the Whales bumper sticker on the rear and installed a cellular phone on the side. And that freezer was classy. It was stylish, it was really cool. And I splashed it with cologne and gave it a credit card for clout. <laughs> then I backed away and I admired the high class freezer. You just might make the cover of Popular Mechanics, I told it, it blushed. <clears throat> Then I opened the door, expecting to see a clean inside, but what I saw was putrid, a stinky and repulsive interior. I could think of only one other option. My freezer needed some high voltage pleasure. I immediately bought it some copies of Play Fridge magazine, <clears throat> the publication that displays freezers with their doors open. And I rented some films about foxy appliances. My favorite was The Big Chill. <laughs> and I even tried to get my freezer a date with the Westinghouse next door, but she gave him the cold shoulder. And after a few days of supercharged after hours entertainment, I opened the door and I nearly got sick. He says, I know what you're thinking. The only thing worse than Max humor is his common sense. Who would concentrate on the outside when the problem is on the inside. A homemaker battles with depression. What is the solution? Ah, uh, have friends over, buy a new dress. A husband is involved in an affair that brings him as much guilt as it does adventure, and it will. The solution, change peer groups, hang out with people who don't make you feel guilty. Or a young professional is plagued with loneliness and his obsession with success has left him with no friends. His boss gives him an idea, change your style, get a new haircut, flash some cash. Case after case of treating the outside while ignoring the inside, polishing the case while ignoring the interior. And what is the result? The homemaker gets a new dress and the depression disappears for a day, maybe. Then the shadow returns. The husband finds a bunch of buddies who sanctioned his adultery. The result, peace until the crowd is gone. Then the guilt is back. The young professional gets a new look and the people notice until the styles change. And then he has to scurry out and he has to buy more stuff so he won't appear outdated. The exterior polished, the interior corroding, the outside altered, the inside faltering, one thing is clear, 
Cosmetic changes are only skin deep. By now, you could write the message of the Beatitude. It's a clear one. You change your life by changing your heart. You go deep down inside because it's a sacred place. And until God is in our heart, it doesn't make any difference how much cologne we use, how many Bibles we carry, how many Bible studies we go to, how many churches we belong to and change and go, and how many times we kneel and how many times we pray and how many times we sing and sing hymns and clap hands until we have really given from the inside out our lives to Jesus Christ. I hate to say it, we stink inside. And every time anyone gets a good look at us, they just are just moved away because they're just aware of how awful we are if they really know us. But the interesting thing is, when we've given our lives to God, we can do all the things. We can do anything and come back every day. And we don't have to get soap out and we don't have to cleanse inside. God does the cleansing for us. He knows exactly what we need, exactly how deep he needs to go to clean, the wounds he needs to heal, and he will do it because he is the great physician. And he's the great cleaner upper of sin. So let's pray as we go to class. And uh, let's do it. Father, we thank you that uh, you care about us at, inside out. And um, that I'm always reminded the one who knows me best loves me most. You know every awful, rotten thing I have ever done. And even then, you love me most. In Jesus' name, we love you. because we have had election. The election is over. Some of the people here voted for people and things that won. Some of you voted for people and things that didn't win. But who is in control anyway? God is in control. This is my father's world. And you know that <clears throat> we talked last week about going in and voting for those people and saying, uh, let this man have a heart turned toward you. Let this man, you know what? I got there and we didn't have levers. <laughs> I said, I said, I can't do this. I've got, I'm programmed to do this. I had to draw those little lines and it took all my concentration. I wanted to make sure they were nice and dark. So it was a little different. But do you know, we really need to remember that <clears throat> Second Chronicles says our work is just starting, just starting, because we know that. Um, as we studied last week, we saw that this is our job, you know. We put the people in, and then we support them, but we support them by confessing our own sins. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, and you can always remember where that verse is, God made it so you would never forget it. It's 2 times 7 is 14. So whenever you want to know where that verse is, and he said, if my people, that's us, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked, disobedient ways, wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and what? Heal their land. That means that God is about doing a wonderful thing if we are about doing a wonderful thing. If we are about communicating with him, it's a very important verse. And so our job is really beginning today because it's all over. Whoever is in, uh, God knew would be there. Now someone brought this for me. How nice. They received this in the mail this week. 
and it's the Supreme Court justices. So remember last week I asked you if you all knew their names, and of course we didn't. We all confessed that we didn't, that if we did pray for them, we did a blanket, God bless the Supreme Court justices, whoever they are, God, but that we really need to be praying for them. So some way I'm trying to find a way that I can size this down, and maybe we could all even have their names on it, and, and maybe have stickums in our Bible or something, or some way. If, and if anybody has seen a better picture or a smaller picture, let me know. But I appreciate that, and I think it really came from God that it came right after last week. And so last week we we found that, and I don't know if you talked about this in your class in your review, that Jesus is the Judge, the King, the Priest, and the Prophet. And that we were to choose from among good men, we were to choose judges and kings and priests and prophets when we go into the promised land. But God had the final vote for the one who would be the one who would be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He will judge everyone. The priest the, the priest who stands before the throne, always now coming for you and for me and for our sins, and the, the prophet the prophet of all times and so we we had that last week and also we found out that there were some things that God detested there were some very detestable things and uh, that many of us were searching for uh, answers for our problems in all the wrong places and I urged you all and I and I hope if I ever say anything that's terribly legalistic um, I probably mean it I try I try to come I try to cover it a little better than I do uh, sometimes, but I, I was really serious last week when I when I said, you know, I'm not telling you about not reading your a horoscope and all that stuff. I didn't. Those words were not for me. Those are from God. And that, that if if ever I do say something that you would question, I don't think anyone questioned this, but if you do, uh, put a note in the box, uh, and we'll get to you. We've had a note in the box that I have not ignored. I have it on my desk because I am struggling with it myself, and it was on a yellow piece of paper about this big, and, and whoever wrote it, don't think I have not uh, planned to answer that. I'm just sort of praying about it a lot. It's, a, it's the question of all questions, and uh, so we will talk about it. So we've been learning from the past. Uh, we found in Deuteronomy, we're learning from the past that there are laws to live by, and now we are learning about keeping the covenant. And this is, we're beginning today the third speech of Moses. He is speaking again, and hopefully, prayerfully, we're listening. Moses speaks and we listen, and these are the options, he says. You don't get too many options. It's either good or bad. Obedience, which will bring blessings and life in abundance, and we can choose that right off and just say, today I choose, Lord. I choose this day that I will serve you, that I will be obedient. I choose that I will receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I will surrender it all to you, and I will deal with this on a daily basis. I will come before you. I will kneel every chance I get. You know that you can actually dry your hair on your knees with a hair dryer? I mean, you know, you need to make time. You can kneel in the shower. You can kneel under when you're, I don't even know if you shampoo your hair in the shower, but you can kneel. They have these little things, these little uh, things you can buy at the, I think probably at Thrifty or someplace, that you, the kneel, kneeling pads are used so you scrub your floor on your knees, and probably none of you do that. But you could cry, and you could pray when you scrub your floor on your knees too. But you can keep one in your shower, and you can kneel when, and you know, you can actually go around and tuck your bed in when you're kneeling. I mean, you can get mileage out of being on your knees and try to be really creative about that so you can keep coming to the Lord and, and that you can keep dealing with, with what's happening in your life. You don't have to be on your knees. You can pray in your car. You can pray standing up. And you can pray in bed. And you can pray walking. You can pray talking. I mean, you can pray all the time. But you want to get a lot of mileage out of coming before the Lord. And then, um, then he says, if you don't want to do this, this is your other choice. Uh, you can uh, be disobedient. And, you know, last year, remember, we talked about ob obedience uh, a couple years ago, maybe, that in the middle of that word is a word called die. And obedience is really obedience. It means die to yourself. Just die to yourself. Surrender to God. Be the new man in Christ and die to yourself. So disobedience would mean <laughs> I'm not going to die to myself. I'm going to just do what I want, and I want what I want when I want it. And when you have disobedience, 
You will have destruction and drought and defeat and death and curses and disease and crop failure and exile. And finally, you will be worth nothing. Nobody would even buy you for a slave. We had that this week. You wouldn't even be fit for a slave. And so you choose obedience or disobedience, obedience or disobedience. And one is the absolute end and one is the new beginning. So it's all our choice. Isn't God good? Isn't God good that he, he didn't just come and just cram something down our throat and say, you're going to do this, I don't care what you say. But he said, no, if you're going to be like me, you have to have a choice. You have to be able to choose me. You have to be the person who says, I choose you, I love you, I am in awe of you, and I want to worship you. And God made us that way because we are in his image. He has a choice. And we must really make those decisions. And so we're getting to the place now where Moses is going to stop speaking. Next week he's going to talk a bit. And then, next, then we're going to have, we're going to pass over into, uh, with Joshua. Joshua is going to be the person. We're going to put, place the mantle on him. He's going to know. And then we're going to have a little time, a little sad time with Moses. And then he's going to die. And we're going to see that God buries him himself. But no one knows where he is. And then we're going to go home. We're going to celebrate the Lord's birthday at Christmas time and come back for the Psalms. So we are, you've done real well. We are three-fourths of the way through Deuteronomy. Let's give us a hand. <laughs> it's, a, it's tough, isn't it? Did you, I, you know what? I didn't know it was going to be this hard. I think if I'd known it was going to be this hard, I would have said, let's don't do it. But it's good for us, and it's timely. Oh, you can tell that God wants us to do it. So now we're dealing with these people, and in your lesson, remember it said they're, they're poised, they're, they're standing there, they're ready to, to go on a diving board, and Moses says, wait, but wait, but wait, but wait. You know, it's like the whistle ready to go. They want to go in now. They're ready to go in. And, and, you know, some of them were alive. Some of them remember, and they've heard the story about what's in that promised land. They heard the story about when J Jacob, or when um, um, Caleb and Joshua went in, how they saw this land of milk and honey. Remember, they came back with the 12 spies, with, and they came back, and, and they reported what they had seen, and they said, grapes? They have grapes? You would not believe the clusters of grapes. Why, it takes two men to carry them on their shoulders, a bunch of grapes. They have a stick, and they have to carry them. And they remember that story, and they're ready. They're ready for fruit. They want to go in the land of milk and honey, and Moses says, wait. If you want fruit, you have to have commitment. You have to have commitment. You're going to have to commit to the new covenant. And it's the same way with us. No fruit without commitment. No joy without commitment. Until we really surrender and commit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's holding him back and he said, before you go in, we're going to talk about commitment. What I'm going to tell you truthfully, what will happen to you if you go in and you don't do it God's way? And the sad thing is, I don't know if you thought of this, Moses knows they're not going to do it God's way because he was a prophet and he knows. What a sad thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Moses and uh, thank you for a man who uh, told us things about himself that were not really all that great and about his anger, and anger when he kills somebody without really consulting you, anger when he broke the tablets, uh, when he got, brought them down from Mount Sinai and broke the Ten Commandments. And Lord, we thank you that he let us know uh, his weaknesses and, and yet that you used him in this mighty way. And Father, we know that there is not one person in, uh, in this room, including me, uh, that you cannot use, that if we are willing, and Father, we are at a time in our lives and in our country, we know that you want to use us. And so, Father, this rest of this year, just use these lessons so that we never forget what we learned here. We never forget the truth of your word. And now be with us, Father, as we, as we talk about some very harsh things that are hard to understand. And uh, have the Holy Spirit, Father, uh, teach us the truth that we need to know from you. In Jesus' name we pray. So the third message, and we remember it is at the close of his day, is sort of like a billboard uh, where he says you're going to have to keep the, con uh, the covenant. Now he wants, uh, remember he chose some godly men 
Uh, we talked about that last week, about how Jethro, his father-in-law, had come to Moses, and he said, Moses, what are you doing? You are going to have burnout. You're going to wear yourself out. You're trying to do it all yourself. And so he told them, he said, you need so to choose some good men to help you. And he told them how to choose them, and they were godly men. He was to choose. And you know, godly men want godly leaders. And godly, we want godly leaders. And so that was one of the important things that he did here was that he found the men, and then he had them come and talk to these godly men. And if the problem was too big, then they brought it to Moses. And that was a way that we have really learned about how to run a church. And we need to watch people. Uh, <clears throat> we want to follow people. We want to see how godly people work. I, I heard a story about a, a man who was, was injured in, in the war, and he came home, and, and he had done something to his leg or his hip, and, and he limped. And he, every time he walked, he would drag his leg a little bit, and all the time like this. And, and um, uh, someone went to see him, and they saw that he had this little boy, and the little boy went all the time. He was always walking like this, and they said, what happened to him? And uh, he said, nothing happened to him. It's just that he loves his father, and he does everything his father does. And he has taken on this limp. Isn't that beautiful? And, and you need to know, too, that if people are watching you, who think you are godly women because you're in church and Bible studies, so they're going to watch you. And you want to make sure you don't limp. You want to make sure that whatever you do is a godly, godly thing. And so Moses said, I'm going to be gone. We know that from other biblical references. And he said, you're going to have to go in there, and God has no grandchildren. And you know, that that's one of the saddest things I've ever heard about God. Can you imagine never having a grandchild? Who has grandchildren in here? Is that a sad thing? He has no grandchildren. He only has children. They're only children of God. And so Moses says, we're going to have this whole new generation go in, and you're going to have to learn how to do this. You're going to have to set up the stones. You're going to have to learn to, to uh, worship. You're going to have to establish a place to worship. Now, you remember <clears throat> that uh, this was where we came out of Goshen over there, and we came all the way down here to Mount Sinai. Wave your hand. You're, there you are. You're good as anything. And then we came back, and remember, he, he had the... Um, the, the, uh, ten, the Ten Commandments here in the law, and he came back down again, and they had some problems. But then when they started to go in, when God said after two years of being in the desert, he said, it's time to go in. And so they went up, and that's when they sent the spies in, and the people decided not to go. And so God said, all right, you don't have to go, but you're going to spend uh, 40 years, 38 probably more, years wandering around in the desert before you go in until all the men 20 years and over die because the other people did not know right from wrong, and so God was going to save them. So they wandered around, and now that the time has really come, and these you know that's why these men are anxious to get in, and they're up about here. Let me get on it like this so I can see it. The print is so small. And they're right in here. This, well, they're on the land, in the land of Moab, and they're going to go across right here. Jericho is there, and here's Mount Ebal, and here's Mount Gerizim. And uh, so when they crossed right here, this was where they were going to establish their uh, place to worship. And this is Shechem. This is where, where the city of Shechem is. And I don't know if you remember, but when we studied, and if you've ever studied about uh, uh, <clears throat> Abraham in Genesis 12, that's where God made a covenant with Abraham. That's when he said, no matter what anyone does, no matter what anyone says, no matter where you go, what happens? I am going to promise to give you this land, and your people are going to be great in number, as many as the stars in the sky. And he said, they're going to, this is a promise to you, and you know what Moses, what uh, Abraham did right then at Shechem? He set up a stone, and he built an altar. So this is a great place to have an altar. And so he said, go in. <clears throat> when you cross the Jordan, you're going to go in. You're going to set up some stones, the memorial stones, and I want you to always remember the past. I want you to remember my faithfulness, but I also want you to remember that you're going to bring the law to these people in Canaan. You're going to go in. Now, they're going to, we all need a place to worship. You know that. I've said that before. You need, one, you need a place that you have for worship. But you want to always, when we worship, to always remember what God has done. 
what God has done, what God has done for you. The, the Israelites prayed. They always said, oh, God, who brought us out of Egypt. Oh, God, who fed us manna in the desert. Oh, God, who brought us across the Red Sea. Oh, God, you know, they went over and over. And we need to do that. It increases our faith. It increases our faith. And he said, write all the words of this law, which is probably the whole book of Deuteronomy too, when you have crossed over to enter the land that the Lord has given you, a land flowing with milk and honey, and then it is time then to recommit your life to the, the uh, covenant. And, you're going to, and it's not going to be a thing where you're going to just use a box mix. It's, you're going to start from scratch. You're going to build the altar. Uh, you're going to build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones, and no works are going to be involved in this. No iron. You're not going to carve it. Now, we've talked about that because God says we don't want to risk influence of going out of this country and getting, and get, this is very hot, so I have to turn it off, but I don't think we need it. Uh, <clears throat> but he said we don't want to get the influence of anyone else, nor do we want any adornment, any human adornment. And in Exodus 20, it says, do not build it with dressed stones. You will defile it. And we don't understand that, do we? But that's what God said. If you use a tool on it, it will be defiled. And do not go up my altar on steps because you are not to have people see your nakedness. Your nakedness. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? It's in Exodus 20. <clears throat> now, God is not against creativity, but he never wants us to create our own religion. We always go back again to this book that I have so much stuff on that I can't even see. I think I'll move some of it. How about this? But he wants us to always go back and find in here how we're to do it, how we're to worship, where we're to worship, and to pray. And there's so much for these people to rejoice about that they're going to go there, they're going to build the altar. Now, we know that the Levites will be there and that they will have the Ark of the Covenant. They will have the Ark that has the Ten um, the Commandments in, and they will bring this in, and they will carry it because from other Bible knowledge, we know that they traveled with it. And remember last week we said they supported the Levites. They paid all the money for them. They fed them and everything. So they're going to go in. Now, I can tell you just a bit about how they did this. In the center between Ebal, which is north, and Gerizim south, in the center, the Levites would set up a place where they would have the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Levites would read the law. Now, we know that the people were on two different mountains, and we know they were divided up. I had some. I could not understand why they divided them up the way they did. And I spent a lot of time, did anybody wonder why, why they were divided up that way? Did you wonder? I wondered. The one thing I noticed that, um, let me just turn to that verse because I've got it in here. The one thing I noticed was that um, the uh, Gerizim, which was to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin were there. Now that's in verse 12 of 27. Now <clears throat> those, those people of course, were the, the sons of Leah and, and um, uh, Jacob. Am I right? Yeah, it's Leah and Jacob. And, and Jacob and Rachel. And, um, and so these were the people, of course, and these are, these are kind of good guys. I mean, Judah, of course, is the line of Christ, and Levi is the priest, and we know that they've been forgiven because they had come over and sta stood with Moses when the tablets were broken, when he said, who will stand with me for the Lord? And the people from the tribe of Levi came. Now, Joseph and Benjamin have always been kind of favorites of ours, and uh, so that looked really good. And then we saw on the other mountain, Mount Ebal, the, to pronounce the curses were Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, who was the youngest son of Leah and Jacob, and Dan and Naphtali. Now, the all but Reuben, I can understand. I mean, I can understand Reuben. Reuben had committed incest. So I thought, well, maybe he was not a real pleasure. And Gad and Asher, Dan and Naphtali were of the handmaidens, and maybe they weren't. But I don't know why Zebulun was there, except to balance it out. I have looked. I have looked in the encyclopedia, I've looked everywhere, I've looked in the script, I've looked everywhere, and I do not know, but I wondered if in light of what we studied, if he had a secret sin, and that God chose to put him on the other mountain. And don't ever say that's, that you heard that here, but 
it's, a, it's something to wonder about. Why would God do it? You know this. God did it for a reason. Because we keep finding that everything he did has a purpose. And so he puts them on the mountains. Now the Levites will recite to all the people. The Levites are going to recite and, and uh, they're, going to, they're going to call out the, uh, the uh, detestable things. They're going to call out these things. And I thought today, in fact, I asked Leanne if she would come and maybe, maybe even Barbara, I don't know, but if, we, if I would read them and if they would stand just so that you would have an experience of, of hearing this the way they did, if I would read the verse and then you would sing amen. Because they did it antiphonally. I know that from some other things of, of the Jewish faith that I've read about. But I'm wondering uh, if they sang it. Because this was an area that was like an amphitheater between these two mountains. The voices carry far and wide. And there were, you know, millions of people there. There were, I don't know how many people actually, but we know that there were 601,000 men who went in and I don't know if they got the wives got to stand with them and sing. But would you would you help us, Leanne, sing this? What what is the amen we'll use? And you choose it. <clears throat> you sure? Okay, Barbara, you want to come and do a help with an amen? <clears throat> um, want to do an easy one? What's an easy one? Uh, yeah, on one note, that'll do it. Okay. Now you, when I, after I read it, okay, mm. okay, okay, we're going to do this together and, and just begin with a feeling of what these people were hearing. And as they're hearing it, they're responding to it. They're saying, so be it. Yes, I believe this is so, God. Okay, cursed is the man who carves an image or casts an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, the work of the craftsman's hands and sets it up in secret. Cursed is the man who dishonors his father or his mother. Cursed is the man who moves his neighbor's boundary stone. Amen. Cursed is the man who leads the blind astray on the road. Amen. Cursed is the man who withholds justice from the alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Cursed is the man who sleeps with his father's wife, for he dishonors his father's bed. Cursed is the man who has sexual relations with any animal. Cursed is the man who sleeps with his sister the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. Amen. Cursed is the man who sleeps with his mother-in-law. Cursed is the man who kills his neighbor secretly. Cursed is the man who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent person. Cursed is the man who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out. You can see, as I'm sure there, it was so impressive to hear thousands of voices and acknowledge that this would be the word 
from God. Now this they did later. When they go into the land, they really do this. And you know, the blessings are not recorded here in the same way for us. Almost maybe so for the impact, for the warning, for the warning, because it is so important for these men who are going to go in, and they're going to be faced with moving boundary lines and, and many of these things. And you know, Numbers 14 told us, and I think we've memorized this one time, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And when these people go in, they need to know that they have to be forgiven for their sins. And here we have the Levites, and here we have the, the people with the blessing, on Gerizim, responding to the blessing. Now, the, the, all the curses and blessings came from the tribe. They were the tribe of Levites. But the, and then here on Ebal, we have the curse. We have this responding to the cursings. But the important thing we found on Mount Ebal was we found that that's where God wanted them to have the altar. Because for every curse, for every curse, God has a way out. For everything, as bad as these sins are, as impossible as you can imagine, as awful as they are, some of the things these people do later, and we've read and studied that, God has provided a way out. For us, the good news, of course, is Jesus Christ. That he was cursed. He took all of the sin for these people once and for all and for us forevermore he took that upon himself while we were yet sinners he did that for us that he died for us because of his love for us and there is so much room for us to go in there is so much grace god has left over you know it's like it just flows it's like a river of life flowing down there is more grace to be giving, given to us than hearts willing to receive. There are packages and bundles and stacks of grace just waiting to be picked up by people that you and I can bring to the Lord by being open to what God is saying, by coming in and saying, Lord, who do you have for me to tell about your blessings? Who do you have for me that I can come and I can tell that they need to be in the Word. Do you know, um, uh, the interesting thing is, I don't know how any of you voted, and we're surely not trying to talk about that, but the interesting thing is, I think that all of the men who ran for president and vice president, I think, uh, are Christians. I don't know if they study God's Word. I don't know if they, if you said, if you ever, if you ever studied Deuteronomy, I'm sure those like, never. But, uh, but, but I, and maybe not. Maybe that's the book we need to send them, a little pamphlet or something. But, but I, I do believe that. Do you realize what a blessing that is? You know, when you look at those people and you think, I mean, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard some positive things about every single one of those, those people, except Stockdale, but I, I can't believe he was in a prison camp and came through it without having come face to face with the Lord. Maybe you know that that's happened. But, uh, but it's very important for us to, to be praying now for those men, praying that they will know that these things, these curses will fall on our nation if we are disobedient too. If we started, uh, we were talking the other day, if we started with 12 brand new people, they brought their wives and they each brought two children. So they brought one girl and one boy, and we went out and we started our own brand new, clean, spanking new country. And we didn't let anyone else in. We stayed in total control. We would end up just like these people without a savior. There is no way that we could do it. We could not start a whole new world without God. It's impossible. And these curses that we see are, from, are results from not hearing God's word, voice and not, and not being able to do what he says because we don't even listen. But the blessings all result from hearing God's voice and doing exactly as God says. The blessings were so beautiful, you thought, why would we choose any other? You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, Deuteronomy 28.4. The crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. And you know it doesn't tell you that you're going to have a lot of them. 
That's not it. That's not where blessings come. I mean, it's not how much money. It's not for great jobs. It's the blessing that comes from in your heart, from knowing that you are being blessed by God because you're being obedient to him and his word. Your basket and your kneading trowel will be blessed, and you will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. And in verse 12, it says, The Lord, how could you, how could you be any better than this? The Lord will open the heavens and the storehouse of his bounty to send rain on your land and season and bless all the work of your hands and you will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. That's what we need to be. We need to claim that verse and say, Lord, we, you know we need rain. Uh, we need rain everywhere probably. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Nobody's going to wag us if we're going to pray and say we want to be a godly nation. And you know what? We want Russia to be a godly nation. We want Japan to be a godly nation. We want every nation to be a godly nation. We want to pray this for everyone. And when you look at the difference in the, in the blessings and curses, exaltation and health, reproductiveness, prosperity, victory, and God's favor, and look at the opposite of these, of these blessings, the curses that came in verses 15 to 44 were awful. Humiliation, barrenness, unfruitfulness. Now, don't grab any of these and ever say to someone that they are not pregnant and have never been able to have a child because they've been disobedient to God. Don't ever say that and label a person. These are, these are for whole nations. This is, this, is, uh, this is all of us too, possibly, but as a result from the original sin, we have all of these things happen, but it's never a pointing your finger at any one person. And yet, and yet, I know that I am guilty of some things and that God has, has, has disciplined me for it severely. So it will happen to you, but don't you tell that person. Let God tell that person that there are mental and physical breakdown. That means the heart and the soul and the mind, and there's so much of that. Family breakdown, confusion, depression, poverty, defeat, suicides. Suicides. We have so much suicide and oppression, failure, and God's disfavor. And do you know, bottom line, that's the worst, God's disfavor. Our society today is reaping the harvest of centuries of wrong choices. Centuries. And, and we think, well, I didn't do anything. I didn't personally do anything. We did. I did. No man is an island. Every single sin I have committed, everything I have done, will and has probably already affected other people. And so that's what we need to do is say, oh, God, will you show me if there's any place in here where you can deal with my life. I mean, we need to clean up. We want God to open it up, the door of our heart. We talked about that earlier, the freezer with the stench, and go in and clean and scrub and make us people so that, that we will not have consequences in our life. We're going to have truth, and we're not going to be uh, constantly living under fear. Someone used that as one of the words, what finally comes as fear. Do you know it would be fear? It would be fear at the end. We had words like, Finally, you know, there would, you would lose your salvation, you would have eternal death, you would have this, you would have this. And, and one person said, fear. And I said, yes, that's good. Because that's what it will be like, fear. We, it will be fear that we have never known before. Fear that is just overwhelming when we are without God, if we are. And we had, in, we had the, some things about uh, where uh, Moses, the great prophet, told some things that would happen and about the exiles, and we know those exiles happened. We know that they had the great crop failures and, and uh, that they were overrun by people that the Jews were. We know that in the uh, <clears throat> that in 722 B.C., maybe our notes talk about this, that the kingdom was divided and the Assyrians came in, and never in the history ever of, of the world has there been a harsher or crueler people than the Assyrians were. And then in 586, the Babylonians came, they, the people came back, they, came, they were brought back, but then the Babylonians came back to, and they, they came in and they took the southern kingdom and they tore down Solomon's temple. And then finally, Ezra and Nehemiah, they brought the people back again. But every time these people suffered, they did eat their children. They were starving. I mean, women ate their afterbirth. I mean, this, Josephus tells us this. These things happen just like God's word said. He didn't say this and put this in for shock value. He said, this is what will happen if you do this, and they did it, and this is what happened. And in 70 AD, 
Again, the, the Romans came in and never, ever, oh, it was awful. They came in, they destroyed the city, they crucified hundreds of Jews. They hung them and they killed the children of the Jews without any qualm at all. They killed them, they took the lives, and then they led them down to the seashore and they put them in boats and they sent them back to Rome to be used for slaves and they had too many slaves. So instead of using them for slaves, and they, their, their lives were worthless. They couldn't sell them as slaves anymore. Just like the end of this lesson said, then you know what they did with them? They threw them into arenas and they made them fight each other and kill each other. And when, and when that wasn't good enough, they put them in and they watched them. They watched the lions eat them. They threw them in at night. They took lanterns and they dipped them in tar and they lit them and they put people on these on these sticks and they dipped them in tar and they lit them and used them for light so that the people could cheer and watch as they fed the people to the lions and they ate them. And this is all the result of disobedience and this may be part of our life yet. The Jews have always been scattered, always been scattered. They came back in 1948 and we wanna always remember Praise God for a little funny Harry Truman from Missouri who I didn't vote for and didn't think was all that great. But he knew history and he knew the Bible and he knew that the Jewish people were supposed to come back to that land. And he gave them back their land and they went back to their land, but they are still scattered. They are still many places. But one day, one day in that land, Jesus Christ is going to return. He is going to land on the Mount of Olives. He is Peter going to come. And all eyes will see him, and they will call him Lord. They will see his hands, the pierced hands and feet, and they will know who he is. But in the meantime, because of disobedience, we see recorded for us, not so we know history, but so we know God. We know that he is a loving, merciful God because he has provided a way out for us and that the sins of these people are no greater than the sins that I have committed. Because in God's eyes, sin is sin. It is black, black, not white, not gray, it is black. So we'll deal with these things together and uh, give us a couple more weeks and then we'll go to the Psalms. Come let us reason together. That's what God says. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. Come, let us reason together. Let's pray. Father, this is a big lesson. I want to tell you, I can't do too many more of these. But neither can you, right? You are tired of it too, surely. You never sleep, and you never slumber, and you take all of this in. But Father, today, just put around us such an anointing of the Holy Spirit that we will lean to you, that we will open our hearts to you, and we will receive Jesus as the one who died for us so that none of these things have to happen to us, that we will obey you, and we will have life everlasting with you. Father, we need joy and peace, and we need wisdom. Come to us and use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ran over. I'm sorry. But you are good to stay.